incredible. So, all right, Judges 13, this is the birth of Samson. You probably all heard something about Samson, and you probably all heard something that was dead wrong about Samson. We're going to look at the record of Samson from the Bible. God devotes four chapters to this man. He is the last of the judges. It's not the end of the book of Judges, but he's the last of the judges. And as you recall, the Bible wraps up this book by stating in Judges 21-25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And we have seen the nation in decline, 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 decline. By the time we get to Samson, it's almost, almost to rock bottom. In fact, we read in verse 1, And the children of Israel did evil again on the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them, not, not from, into the hand of the Philistines, 40 years, period, new paragraph. There's two things the verse doesn't say, and it doesn't say them loud and clear. This time, Unlike the previous times we have read about, the nation does not repent. This time, the nation does not cry out to God. This time, they don't even ask for help. They have become, for all intents and purposes, Philistines. They don't even know they're oppressed. They've become part of the oppression. They don't even know that they've lost their national identity and their spiritual relationship to God because they don't have any. And the second thing the verse says loud and clearly without saying it is, there is not a man. There's no Gideon. There's no Jephthah. There's no Othniel. There's no Ehud. God has to get a man and a woman and ask them to give birth to a son and raise him right in hopes that 20 years down the road God will have someone he can use. There's not one man, not one woman left in the country that cares enough about God and cares enough about the ways of God for the Lord to put his hand upon his shoulder and say, I'm going to use you to break this yoke of, of uh, oppression to the Philippine, uh, Philippine, the Philistines. <laughs> they were pressed by the Philippines. They got in these boats and came all the way to the Middle East. No, the, the Philistines, that probably won't be the last time I say that in the next couple of weeks here. Now watch in verse number two. The Bible says, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites. The twelve tribes of Israel, Dan was the smallest, and Zorah was a very tiny and obscure town in that tribal region. His name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and barrenot. Now you're really down, you're really down to cases when your only hope is a child who hasn't been born, and the mother of that child is a woman who can't bear children. That's that's about as, as desperate a situation as a nation can be in. We have no deliverer living. We're going to have to have one born and raise him up. And I don't have any parents I can trust except that man and that woman, and that woman can't get pregnant. That's where we are. Now, I don't know what situation you're in today. I don't know what you're up against today. I don't know how desperate your circumstances are today. But if God can deliver in this situation, I'm certain he can deliver in yours. It might take a generation or two. It might take a decade or two. See, that's what we want. We want to microwave God and microwave answers to prayers, and we want to spend decades getting ourselves in trouble and have God get us out of that trouble this morning. Might take a while. Might take a while, but he can do it. Now, verse number three, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now... Thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Here's what I want to know. Do you have a now God? And if, if your now God doesn't do it now, are you through with him? Or do you have a God who knows how desperate things are now, but also knows what he is able to do tomorrow or next week or next month or next year if you will trust him? He's not asking this woman to watch a miracle today. 
He's asking this woman to believe you will conceive. Nine months later, you will have a child. Several years later, having raised this child, I will use this child to do something for me. Are you willing to trust a God who isn't going to do it now? Are you willing to trust a God who isn't going to do it three months from now? Are you willing to trust a God who might not do it until your child who is not yet conceived is 21 or 22 years old? Will you stay with God long enough for God to do something in your life? Not many people are willing to do that. They switch God as often as they switch automobiles. They, they, they switch uh, trusts and deities and hopes uh, on a regular basis. Why? Well, I, I tried the Lord and he didn't come through for me. When? This afternoon? When? In the time you allotted to him? Well, you know, I was having trouble in my home and I did these three things for a week and I didn't have, you know, the greatest home on earth, so I'm going to try something else. I was having some financial troubles. It took me 25 years to dig myself into this hole, and I asked God to get me out, and I gave him a month. Come on, these, these people have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years placing themselves under Philistine oppression. And God says, I'll get you out, but you're going to have to wait a while. Because it's going to take me some time to get all the, all the things lined up that I need to line up. Are, are you willing, are you willing to trust God's power and grace and might and timetable? Because one thing to believe God has power. It's one thing to believe God has grace. One thing to believe God cares. But are you going to give God a month or two to prove that he cares? How about a year or two to prove that he cares? How about a couple of decades to prove that he cares? If you're going to trust God, you can't trust him for 30 minutes. You've got to trust him with your life. And some things, some things take more time than, than we're interested in, in waiting. But here's what he said. And thou, now, behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but... Thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Lord said, Lord said, I'm going to have a glorified body. Not now. Lord said, the Lord said, I'm going to be completely victorious over all sin temptation. But not now. The Lord said, the Lord said, I'll see him face to face. Not now. How many of those exceeding great and precious promises in the Bible don't have a date on them? But praise the Lord, they don't have an expiration date on them. So let's, let's believe God and trust God that he will do everything he said he would do when he is ready to do it. But let's not quit on him until he does. Verse number four. Now therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Well, that's a really strange business. Now, a Nazarite is not what Jesus was, and Jesus was not a Nazarite. Jesus was, was from a town called Nazareth, and that made him a Nazarene. But a Nazarite is a, a person who voluntarily entered into a particular covenant agreement with God. And I want you to read it together with me from Numbers chapter number 6. Don't lose judges, we'll come back. Numbers chapter 6 and verse number 1. Numbers chapter 6 and verse number 1. <clears throat> In every other case in the Bible, this is a voluntary situation. In the case of Samson's parents, it was mandated for them by this angel of the Lord. Now, number six, verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. All right, now... The children of Israel, they all belong to the Lord. But most of them are not going to take that very seriously. 
It'd be like today, tens of hundreds and tens and hundreds and thousands of people belong to a church or say they're saved and belong to the Lord. Very few of them take it seriously. So the Lord said, if you want to really, really zero in on this thing, if you want to really get serious about your devotion to me, verse 3, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. So they're not the same. There's wine in the Bible. And there's strong drink in the Bible. And shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. We call those raisins. There is absolutely nothing wrong with eating grapes. Bib biblically, there's nothing wrong with eating grapes. There's nothing wrong with eating raisins. There's nothing wrong with eating or uh, with drinking grape juice. There is, okay? But the Lord said, I want you to be so serious in your devotion to me that you are willing to, do th to stop doing things that aren't even wrong to go farther than is commanded just to remind yourself of the serious nature of your commitment to me. That's what he's asking. Now, if you're an Israelite and you have, you have come into the promised land, uh, you don't have 7-Elevens, you don't have Publix, Winn-Dixie, uh, you, you, don't, you don't have convenience stores, you don't have Amazon, you drink water if you have a spring and a well or if you have sufficient rainfall to catch water and preserve it. So water is not a big deal. You're going to grow your beverages. Okay? Grapes, easiest. Grapes, most plentiful. The, the land, the, the environment, the climate of, of the, Israel is suited best for grapes. They're everywhere. When they came in to spy out the land, what did they bring back with them? A cluster of grapes on a pole. So what he's asking these people is, I'm asking you to not only stop doing something that is okay to do, but when you stop doing this, your life is going to become very inconvenient. When you have friends over, you're not going to be able to serve them what they're accustomed to drinking. And when you go to visit friends and they offer you something to drink, you're going to have to decline it, knowing there's probably not going to be anything else to drink in the house at the meal. The angel Lord says to Samson's parents, before you ever conceive that child, I want you to be willing to go farther than anyone you know is going. And to eliminate some things from your life that might not even be sin, and to establish some things in your life that might make your life rather inconvenient. Because I really need that boy to be devoted to me. He's asking these people to do more than join a church. He's asking these people to do more than attend a church. He's asking these people to be so serious about God that even most of the people who claim to be serious about God will think they're rather fanatical. Because I don't have anybody right now that I see that is concerned about Israelites living like Philistines and I need somebody to start doing something for me to turn the nation back to God. It's going to have to start with some parents that are serious enough about God to raise their children differently than everyone else is raising their children. Look at the next thing he says. In verse number 5, all the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head. Until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So, there were a lot of people in the 60s dedicated to God. They, uh, <coughs> they went so far as to do away with their razor, and their shower, and their shoes, and just... <laughs> 
Look, in the normal, well, let me show you from the Bible. First, don't, don't lose numbers. Now you've got two places to, to not lose track of. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me show you a, a curious little thing in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> And verse number 13, or 14, 14. 1 Corinthians 11, 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now, if your society, and please, please just relax, this, won't, this will be painless. <clears throat> if your society decides we don't want to recognize any distinctions in dress or appearance or mannerisms or roles between men and women, eventually your society will reach a place where they don't know the difference between a man and a woman. See, the Lord, the Lord puts rules in place that don't make any sense to us because all we see is the moment but God sees the end result. And God says, back in the day when you could tell from a block away a man from a woman, the woman never thought she was a man, and the man never thought she was a woman. But first you start dressing them alike, and then you start treating them alike, and then you start training them alike, and then you start telling them they're alike, and pretty soon you're going to get to the place where girls think they're boys and boys think they're girls, and their parents don't have sense enough to straighten that out. So God's not looking at where you are. He's looking at where you're going. And God said, now, now look, God said, it's a shame for a man to deliberately make himself look like a woman. That's what he said. And it's, it's a shame for a woman to deliberately make herself look like a man. That's, that's what he said. Don't, don't freak out on me. We're just, we're, we're going somewhere here. So the Lord asked Samson's parents to raise him in a way that will cause him to be an outcast in his school, and an outcast in his culture, and an outcast among the other kids his age. I want you to train this child from his earliest days how to live without fitting in. How to live without going along with the custom and the style of the day because if you do like the rest of these parents and raise him to fit in with the Philistine culture, how will he ever be able to stand against the Philistine culture when he's grown? Make sense? So in our day, it seems that the vast majority of churches are trying to make certain that the Philistine culture knows we're just like you. Hey, Philistines, come to our church, we have your music. Come to our church, we have your morals. Come to our church, we will not ask you to be different. In fact, we will strive to be what you want us to be. God says, well, I can't get any help from that church. I can't get any help from that church. I can't get any help from that denomination. I can't get any help from that minister. In fact, so many of these denominations and churches are so far gone, the only hope I've got is convincing some mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers to raise up some children that love Jesus more than Batman. That boys that want to grow up to be men and girls that want to grow up to be women. And, and we've got to start them out so early, surrounded by a Christian family church preacher culture where they're okay with not fitting in with a society that's rejected God. But they know from their earliest days, no, I'm not like you, and I don't want to be like you, and I'm okay not being like you, because you're wrong. 
God didn't put that on Samson when he was 17. He put it on his mother before she was pregnant. God didn't put that on Samson when he graduated from high school. He put that on his daddy before, before Samson was ever conceived. He said, if there's ever going to be any hope for this nation, I need some people who are willing to raise sons and daughters who aren't part of this mess. And they're going to be laughed at for it. You understand, you live in a culture, and maybe you don't. Maybe you just send your kids off to a, a government school, and you think it's like it was when you were in a government school 40 years ago. You know the virgin is now the one that's ridiculed and made fun of. You know the one who thinks that God made people to be heterosexual is now the one that's ridiculed and made fun of. You know, you know the one that doesn't do the drugs is now the weirdo. The one that doesn't drink the beer is now the weirdo. The one that believes in God and the Bible is now the, the, the something wrong. We've got to reprogram this child because the parents are abusing them by not teaching them they came from apes. How much of that do you want the world to pour in your child through the computer and the television before you wake up one day and say, my kid's a mess, let me re-educate them, let me retrain them, let me turn them a different direction. The angel of the Lord said to Samson's parents, I want you to start now. Now I'm barren. I know, it would be a good time to start. I want you to start now. Now I'm not even pregnant. I know, it would be a good time to start. Get all that stuff out of your home before the child's born. Get all that stuff out of your life before you have to say to your child, don't do what I'm doing because God doesn't want you to. And then in Numbers, there's, there's one more here. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse number 6, all the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he should come at no dead body, which an odd thing. You know, some, some fellows wanted to follow Jesus one time, but they weren't in a hurry about it. So the guy said, uh, I need to bury my father. And Jesus said, your father don't need you there. He's dead. He won't even know you, he won't even know you skipped the funeral. Let the dead bury the dead. Follow me. The idea here is what the Lord's saying in this, in this vow of the Nazarite, that there might even be some culturally accepted, valid expectations placed upon you that dedicating yourself to the Lord might cause you to miss out on. You know, if you become a missionary, you won't be there for your grandbaby's fifth birthday. Yeah, I know that. You know, you know if you go to the foreign field to serve the Lord, you might not be there for grandma's funeral. Yeah, I know that. I know that. You, you, you do know that if, if you get all wrapped up in that church business, your kids aren't going to get to be little league superstars. Yeah, I know that. Here's what he said. Verse 7, He should not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die because the consecration of God is upon his head. All the days of his separation he is holy unto the Lord. So back in these days you, you really did have to take care of the family members when they passed away. And the Lord said, you know what, what an insult it would be to the cousins and the uncles and the aunts and, and the nephews and, and, and the brothers and the sisters. You say, well, I, I understand daddy just died but I can't have any part of that. If I got this Nazarite vow, wouldn't that upset people? Well, what, what caused all the problem nation of Israel? For, for 40 years, these Philistines have said, we don't want you doing that. They've said, okay, okay, just don't make fun of us. Okay, okay, just don't, we, we, I mean, we want to be, we, we want you to know that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're all okay with all the Philistine stuff. You know, you might get saved and tell your children, we don't, we don't cuss, and we don't drink, and we don't shack up, and we don't steal. And it might mean that you can't go to Thanksgiving dinner with the kinfolk. It might mean you can't go to the 4th of July barbecue. It might mean you can't hang out on Friday night while all the aunts and uncles get drunk in front of your kids. 
It might mean your kids can't spend the night with grandpa because he's an old perv. The Lord said, if you're going to raise a child that's going to do something for me in this wicked world, you are going to have to risk the misunderstanding of some of your kinfolk because they don't think my way. And what a Philistine would say to Samson's parents is, you hate us, you're hateful. Why can't you just get along? Why can't you get along? How come I always got to come your way for it to be getting along? How come you can't ever come God's way for it to be getting along? All right, back to Judges, back to Judges, chapter 13. And sister, the angel gave this instruction to mom. Dad's going to get in a little bit later, but he gave it to mom. Because dad's going to be out there in that living, and you're going to be training those children. You've got to be really sold out to the Lord, because the Philistines are going to tell you that the fact that you're raising those children while he's out there having a great time shoveling the asphalt <laughs> is because you're oppressed and you're kept under the thumb of a man. And you, right? Yeah, right? So you, you got to buy in to the idea that God wants me to raise these children to accomplish something for the Lord while the Philistine culture is telling you that's the worst thing a woman could ever do. It's a symbol of male oppression and, and that old Bible cruel dominance over women and all the stuff you're allowed to say because of the Bible. The rest of the world, you said something like that, you just get punched in the face or whipped with a cane in a public square. It's amazing, it's amazing how you can go to college as a woman and get a degree as a woman and have a career as a woman and come out of it thinking the culture that allows you to do that is oppressive toward you. That's, that's a messed up education. Anyway, just give everybody something to be twisted up about this morning. Verse number six. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. <laughs> I was so scared. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told, me his, uh, told he me his name. You know, you, you get scared. You're not going to ask even the normal, ordinary questions. What was his name? I don't know. I was scared. I didn't ask him. Where did he come from? I don't know. You see an angel, you ask him where he came from. I don't know what this... But she got this much. Behold, he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child should be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. You want know to be a good time to get serious about God? Now. You want know to be a good time to start doing what the Bible says? Now. Well, you know, if I, ever have, if I ever get married, I'll get serious about the Lord now. Now. If I ever have children, I'll get serious about the Lord now. If I ever find out I've got cancer, I'll get serious about the Lord now. Now. Amen. Now. She didn't wait around. She went and told her husband, said, we've got we to get these things straightened out right now in our life. Why? We're going to have a child. Well, we don't have a child yet. Now. Come on, Manoah, now. Come on, church, Now. Verse number 8, Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, how come I didn't get to see him? <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> uh, it says, uh, uh, Manoah said, O oh Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Excuse me? He already told you. Like people read something in the Bible and say, well, you know, if the Lord speaks to my heart about it, he already did. Well, if the Lord wants me to do it, he'll tell me, he told you, he put it in writing. You don't need a second sign or a confirmation or a, a you know, a feeling or, or a, a, 
right? But no, I said, well, you know, Lord, would you send that angel and tell me what you want us to do? I did. Well, you know my wife. I mean, she tends to. I mean, that's, that's it. He's not going to take it from his wife. So look at verse 9. It's so funny. And God hearkened the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. <laughs> That's great. He said, Lord, you told my wife, but you've got to come again and, and tell us again. He said, okay. And so he goes to the wife again. <laughs> He's not around. That's so funny. And a woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. There's a great Bible term for you. You didn't know you quoted the Bible all the time, did you? When did that happen? Ah, oh, the other day. It's right there in the Bible. And Manoah rose and went after his wife. And sometimes, look, look, if your wife's right with God, you ought to go after your wife. What's going on? I'm not following my wife anywhere. Well, it, if she's right, you're wrong. And she's reading the Bible, you're not reading the Bible. She's praying, you're not praying. She's witnessing, you're not witnessing. You ought to follow her example. How's that? You ladies, ladies like that? Just wave your hand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and Manoah arose, went after his wife, and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? He probably, that, that, that no grapes thing was probably a little too much for him. He's, he's hoping there's some misunderstanding and the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. <laughs> he just leaves him hanging. It's like, you're going to have to listen to her. Because I, I already told her. What are you asking me for? But he's going to fill him in. She, she may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Now, don't, don't, play. look, if, 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 if you're into health food, however you define it, enjoy it, okay? If you, if you don't eat meat, that's fine. More for the rest of us, it's okay. If you'd rather chop the head off a poor defenseless plant, and chop off its arms and that makes you feel better, then do that. Don't, don't come and tell me there's some weird thing here about if the mother eats grapes, the child's going to come out of the womb and not want milk. He's going to want grapes. and all. Look, he's asking the parents to be separated unto God. He's asking the parents to go farther than the law of God requires. And he's asking the mother to take the lead on that thing. That's it. Don't turn the Bible into some... New Age, yoga, health food, meditation, Philistine operation. Okay, it, it, is, it is what it is. I, I, I drink grape juice every morning and have for decades. You draw my blood, blood comes out. Grape juice doesn't come out. It's not, it's not. People are so strange, man. It, some people are as worried about what they put in their heart as they are with the pipe in their mouth, they'd be better Christians. If some people witness as fervently for Jesus Christ as they do for berries, more people get saved. That's, I'm trying to make sure everybody's angry with me before we leave this morning, so <laughs> we just keep going until we hit everybody here. All right, so verse 15. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou would offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. He thinks he's just a really pro kind of a prophet kind of guy and uh, you know, a teller of the future. And he's going to fix him a meal. And the angel of the Lord said, You fix a meal, I'm not going to eat it. Because angels don't eat kids. I don't know whose kid he's going to get. They don't have any kids. No, it's, not, it's, not, it's the little, little goat kind of kid. Oh, the poor little goat. Anyway, verse 17. Manoah said to the angel, Lord, what is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? 
And the angel Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. I want someone who is a great painter to paint that picture. The man and the woman astonished, the fire with the angel in it, and they're going, oh, man, what, a, what a thing that had to be to, to see that. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. In your Bible, just this, this will help you if you're looking for a church and this one seems a little boring to you and you're looking for one with a little more excitement in it. In the Bible, whenever an enemy of God falls down, they fall backwards. Whenever someone who is worshiping God falls down, they fall forward on their faces. You ever seen people falling down in church? Which way do they go? We've almost got everybody. I've almost, <laughs> I've almost made everybody angry. Just two of you left. <laughs> Verse 21. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Now, you want to see something really funny? This is really funny. Guys, sometimes, sometimes... It, it, and Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. <laughs> God said, now let's, let's review. God said, you're going to have a baby. God said, you're going to raise that baby to manhood. Manoah said, we're dead. By the time he got home for lunch, he'd already forgotten what the preacher said. <laughs> it just went right by him, right by him. This is old, but I'll, I'll bring it off the shelf and dust it off. So the, these three fellows went hunting. You, you've heard this, these three fellows went hunting. Uh, contractor, an asphalt man, <laughs> and a preacher. And they set up, each of them sat up in their tree stand because, I mean, what would be more fun than sitting up in a tree stand for hours hoping a deer walks by? And, and, but eventually this, this deer walked by, and they all three saw it. They all three raised their rifles. They all three aimed and pulled the trigger. Bam, down went the deer. They climbed down out of the trees. They got arguing and fighting over who shot him. And the contractor said, I shot him. The asphalt guy said, I shot him. And the preacher said, I shot him. And about that time, a game warden came along. He looked that deer over from stem to stern. He stood up in about a minute. He said, the preacher shot him. They said, how do you know that? He said, the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> Manoah heard everything the angel said, but he didn't hear any of it. He, he got the information, but he didn't process the information. You know why we come back Sunday night? You know why we come back midweek? You know why we listen to sermons during the week? Because we don't get it. We hear it, but we don't get it. We absorb it to some degree, but we don't process it. You're going to have a child, says the angel. And Manoah says, we're going to die because we saw an angel. <laughs> You're going to raise the child, says the angel. Manoah said, that angel's going to kill us because we looked at him. <laughs> he didn't get it. And so the Bible says, verse number 23, but his wife said unto him, now, sir, if in your home that's disallowed, you might miss the message. She might have been listening in church while you were daydreaming. And she might, no, 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 honey, that's not what the preacher said. The preacher said this. Okay? Okay? Now, ladies, it'll, it'll work better if you pick your spots, not 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But, but, but a, a guy that didn't get the message from God, whose wife got the message from God, would do well to listen. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, 
He would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands, neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, uh, have told us such things as these. In the Hebrew it just says, <laughs> weren't you listening? <laughs> like, honey, calm down. He told us we're going to have a baby. This is a great day. Honey, he told us how to raise our child. This is a great day. You mean he's not going to kill us? No, I might, but he's not going to. 24, and the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. You have no guarantees. Everybody's got their own will. I understand that. But if your child is three, God expects you to govern the conduct of that child. If your child is six, 11, 16, under your roof, sitting at your table, eating your food, wearing clothes you bought, the Lord expects you to say, no grapes, no raisins, no razor, no dead bodies. Yeah. Well, Mom, everybody else has got dead bodies. How come they can't have dead bodies? <laughs> because we don't do that in our house. But mom, they're not really dead bodies, it's just a game. <laughs> the last two just fell. <laughs> and, then, and then you say what my father always said, <clears throat> and your children will disagree with you just like <clears throat> I always disagree with my father. Why is it wrong? Want to all say it together? Because I said so. <laughs> that was great. <clears throat> I hadn't had a responsive reading since I was in the congregational church as a, as a boy. You know why it's wrong? Because God said so. That's why. A dad trying to explain to a five-year-old why it's wrong is like God trying to explain to us why it's wrong. He can't explain it to you. And so when your child says, all the other children, that's how our country got in the mess it's in. All the other children all the other parents, all the other families, all the other churches, all the other preachers. It might take 15 or 20 years to make a dent in this ungodly culture. But it's worth doing something now if that might bring it to pass. It's worth investing now in your children, your grandchildren, these bus kids, these Sunday school classes, this youth program. It's worth doing right now. Even if we don't live to see the blessed outcome of it. It's worth doing right by God. I've seen the alternative. It stinks. I've seen what you get by going along. I don't want to go along. God says no, and everybody else says it's okay. I'm going to go with God. I want to go with God. There's some commandments in that New Testament. Uh, there, there's nothing in there about, about raisins or grapes. There's something in there about wine and strong drink. There's something in there about a razor. We read it. There's something in there about Dead. You know everybody's dead in trespass and sins? Except those that are born again through Jesus Christ. You know who you're supposed to be fellowshipping with? Not dead people. Living people. And I, I, I'm telling you, 90 plus percent of the people that did bother to go to church this morning won't be in church tonight. They'll be fellowshipping with dead people. 
It might be dead people on a screen or dead people at a beach or dead people at a, at a shopping center, but I want to fellowship with people that are alive. I want to fellowship with people that are going farther than the culture says they have to go. I want to fellowship with people that are trying to separate themselves so their children will learn how to live without having to be part of this present evil world. Amen. However Samson turned out, and we'll read the sequel tonight, next week, his parents, they're not going to stand before God and answer for Samson at age 40. They're going to stand before God and answer for Samson at age 4. They're not going to stand and answer to God for Samson the adult. They're going to stand and answer to God for Samson the teenager under their roof. May the Lord help us. And, and you, you fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers, you have no idea how important it is that you encourage one another to keep doing things God's way. Because every one of you know the pressure this world puts on you to not go by the Bible, not be part of something as extreme as what you're a part of. Let's help one another. Let's strengthen one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's, let's, raise, a, let's raise a whole generation of young people who got to grow up like Samson. Wouldn't you? Come on. Come on. You're saved now? You're saved now? You're trying to live for the Lord? Wouldn't you like to go in a restaurant and not know those songs? Wouldn't you like to hear people talk about these, these perverted movie stars and not know who they were or what movie they were in? You, you'll never have that. But you could give that to your children. Man, you, you, go, out, you go out this afternoon, just go to the shopping center and start talking about Elisha. Start talking about Jeremiah. Start talking about Titus. Start talking about, and, and people won't have any idea what you're talking about. You know why? Philistine culture. And then go talk to the people that were in church today and faithfully attend church. They don't know who those people are either. Then you start talking about Star Wars and, and superstars and, and the church people know as much about that stuff as the, as the lost people do. Somewhere, if we're going to make a dent in this world that's racing to hell, we're going to have to stop trying to be Christian Philistines and separate ourselves and our children unto God. And I'll tell you, if you think about dropping out of church, you're not going to do it on your own. You're sure going to need some encouragement, some strength, and some, some uh, reinforcement. Amen. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. Try and, try and save a little of this, a little of that. Reach some souls for Jesus Christ. Let's, let's be separate. Let's be different. Let's go farther for God than the, than the norm. The norm stinks. The average is, is lousy. Let's go all in. All in for Christ. Amen. Father, bless your word to our hearts today. Help us, Lord, be serious about it. Help us, Lord, for our children's sake and our children's children's sake to teach them by our conduct and teach them by our conversation that Jesus Christ is more important than all this Philistine nonsense out there. Help us, we ask and pray in Christ's name.